I preached a lesson from the first chapter of Colossians that I entitled, The Effects of True Knowledge. And after I preached that lesson, I, I thought, I want to preach through the book of Colossians. But I realized that there was a lesson or two that I should have preached before I preached that one. So we're going to back up a step or two. I want to in introduce this study by asking you some questions that I hope will help you see that that letter written a couple of thousand years ago is still timely and relevant today. Do the heavenly bodies have any influence over our lives? Well, the folks that read the horoscopes in the newspaper, at least some of them, if not many of them, believe that they do. Is there any kind of relationship to our diet and spiritual living? Does God speak to us immediately in our minds or only through his word, the Bible? Do the Eastern religions have something to offer those who claim to be Christians today? I suspect that you would agree with me that questions like that seem very contemporary. And yet those were some of the issues that the Apostle Paul dealt with in his letter to the Colossians. Therefore, it's an important letter for us today. And we need this letter just as the saints in Colossae needed this letter when Paul wrote it. So let me begin by saying a thing or two about the city of Colossae itself, and then I'm going to say a little bit about the church there and some of the members in that congregation. We'll talk about why Paul wrote this letter and then conclude our study by trying to get a bird's eye view of its content. Well, if you'll look at the map that's before you, Colossae is right about here, and Ephesus is over there, about 100, 120 miles away. And I was really surprised when I ran across this particular map because you can see by the terrain just how roads are going to have to work in that part of, uh, of the country. The city of Colossae right down here was not far from the city of Laodicea and the city of Hierapolis. Laodicea was about 11 miles northwest of Colossae. Hierapolis was about 15 miles north-northwest. The city of Hierapolis was known as a place for health and pleasure and relaxation. You see, there were hot mineral springs in the area around Hierapolis, perhaps like Hot Springs, Arkansas. I got Mark's attention, or Saratoga Springs, New York. People would visit that city because of perceived health benefits from those, those springs. The city of Laodicea was known for its commercial trade and politics about 400 years or so before the time of the Apostle Paul the city of Colossae had been a great city. In fact, the most important city in the area. In the 5th century before Christ, the Greek historian Herodotus described Colossae with these words, and I quote, he described it as, quote, a great city of Phrygia. 
At the beginning of the 4th century B.C., Xenophon described it as a populous city, wealthy and large. It was the center of a thriving textile industry. And there was a certain kind of high-quality wool that was produced by flocks of sheep that pastured in the area that was known as Colossian wool. And the prominence of the city was primarily because of its location at the crossroads of two well-traveled highways. One running east and west from Ephesus, and I'm sure that must have been the route of that city, or that highway, and then there was another highway running north and south. But by the time the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, around 61, 62 A.D., Colossae had seen her better days. In fact, at that time, or near that time, the ancient writer Strabo described it as a small town. Now, if memory serves me correctly, I have been told that Kokomo, uh, some years ago, was larger than it is now. Because a lot of the plants were going full steam, and those plants have shut down and those people have gone elsewhere. Am I, am I right about that? Well, the same kind of thing happened to the city of Colossae. It's not mentioned a single time in the book of Acts. It's not mentioned in any other New Testament letter. In fact, Colossae is mentioned by name only one time in the New Testament, and that is in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2 in this very letter. In his commentary on this book, J.B. Lightfoot says, Without doubt, Colossae was the least important church to which any epistle of St. Paul is addressed. The inhabitants of Colossae were mostly Gentiles. However, there was also a substantial number of Jews that lived in this area. This area was characterized by earthquake activity. In fact, the city of Colossae was destroyed or at least greatly damaged by an earthquake shortly after Paul wrote this letter. I've already mentioned that it was a very fertile area. There were flocks of sheep that pastured nearby. There were chalky waters, uh, good for dyeing cloth. And as I just mentioned, the inhabitants of Colossae were mostly Gentiles although there was a substantial Jewish population. Archaeological work has not been done in the city of Colossae. I ran across this picture in one of my resources. It's not the best picture in the world, but that is a picture of the tell of Colossae, and you can see that it hasn't been excavated. Well, what do we know about the church at Colossae? Well, we don't know really when or how the church was established because the New Testament doesn't give us that information. We do know that it was not established by the Apostle Paul. Notice what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Well, that tends to indicate that, that the Colossians had not seen 
Paul, or at least that Paul had not visited the city of Colossae. Notice what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 4, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, and then in verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, etc., etc. Evidently, Paul had heard about the faith and love of the Colossians, but he had not actually visited this city himself. It's likely, though, that the church in Colossae was established as a result of Paul's work in the city of Ephesus. Remember that Paul worked in that city for about three years. And Luke tells us in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Perhaps one of Paul's associates, like Timothy, went into the regions of Laodicea and Colossae during the time that Paul was in Ephesus and took the gospel to those cities. Or perhaps there were residents of Laodicea and Colossae who visited Ephesus and while there came in contact with the Apostle Paul, learned the gospel, and then took it back home. It may very well be that Epaphras was the one who helped to establish the church in Colossae. Notice what Paul says in the first chapter, beginning in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all of the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And so, that certainly indicates the possibility, if not the probability, that Epaphras was the one who took the gospel to the city of Colossae and helped to establish the church there. We know something about the members of this congregation we know that Epaphras is a member. Paul describes him in chapter 1 verse 7 as a fellow servant and a faithful minister. He's the one, according to chapter 1 verse 8, that declared the Colossians' love to the Apostle Paul, and we know from chapter 4 that he was a native of Colossae. Verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you? And this verse goes on to tell us that he was a bondservant of Christ. He sends his greetings he was always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And verse 13 tells us that he had a great zeal for the Colossians and for those Christians in the cities of Laodicea and Hierapolis. You might turn over to the book of Philemon and keep a finger there because we'll be referring to some things that that little letter tells us. In Philemon verse 23, Paul identifies Epaphras as a fellow prisoner with Paul when he wrote that particular letter. 
We know from things said in Philemon and Colossians that Philemon was a member of the church in Colossae. Paul describes him as a beloved brother and fellow laborer in the gospel in Philemon verse 1. And we learn in verse 2 of Philemon that he and his family were the host of the church. And we know from Colossians 4 and verse 9, because there Paul mentions a fellow named Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Now what do we know about Onesimus? Well, he was Philemon's slave that ran away. And he met Paul in Rome, and Paul taught him the gospel, and now Paul is sending Onesimus back home to his master with the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. So the fact that Paul tells us in Colossians 4 verse 9 that Onesimus was one of you, one of the Colossians, what does that tell us about Philemon? Well, it tells us that he was from Colossae, right? And in Philemon verse 2, Paul mentions a lady named Aphia, perhaps the wife of Philemon and the mother of Archippus, and he mentions Archippus, and in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul says, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it, and so it may very well be that Archippus was the preacher in the church at Colossae. And as I've already suggested, perhaps the son of Philemon and Aphia, Paul describes him in Philemon verse 2 as a fellow soldier with Paul in the gospel. And then there's that runaway slave, Onesimus, that I mentioned a few moments ago. And Paul describes him and some others as a fellow worker in the kingdom in chapter 4 verse 11. And evidently he was a Gentile because Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to you. Paul mentions some of his co-workers in the, in the verses preceding that statement. And he mentions Onesimus later, and so that would tell us that he was probably a Gentile. Well, why did Paul write this letter? Well, he wrote this letter because Epaphras came to Rome where Paul was imprisoned, and he reports about things going on in the church in Colossae. And for the most part, what he reports is positive. It's good. But from the content of this letter, he must have told Paul about a twofold peril that the saints were facing there. It would seem that there was a danger that Gentile converts would revert back to, to paganism. I say that because the sins that the Apostle Paul uh, reproves in chapter 3 were very characteristic of Gentile conduct. He says, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Those were the kinds of things that often characterize the way Gentiles live their lives. 
But then there was also a second danger, a danger that scholars often call the Colossian heresy. Now, all that we can know about this heresy, really we must deduce from the things that Paul says in this particular letter. But from Paul's comments, it would appear that this heresy, this false teaching, was a combination of several elements. Eastern philosophy, Jewish legalism, pagan astrology, Oriental mysticism. This heresy uh, seemed to emphasize asceticism and it may very well have been an early incipient form of Gnosticism. Now, Gnosticism was a false doctrine that really becomes full-blown in the second century after the time of the apostles. But there's good reason to believe that in its early stages, it was a problem that first century Christians were faced with as well. The Colossian heresy apparently emphasized the importance of secret knowledge. In fact, the Gnostics, again, later in the second century, believed that the way to God was through some kind of secret esoteric knowledge that only the initiated could understand. In other words, you had to kind of be in the in crowd. And it was a false philosophy. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 4, Paul says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. In verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. You see, I think we can deduce something about this threat to the church at Colossae from what Paul warns them about. And it involved, evidently, Judaistic ceremonialism. In verse 16 and 17 of chapter 2, Paul says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or, a sab or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Well, why would Paul give the Colossians this warning if they weren't being threatened by this kind of teaching. And in chapter 2, verse 15, he talks about Jesus having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. And he mentions the worship of angels in chapter 2 and verse 18. And he warns against those who would pr promote ascetic practices. In verses 20 and following, he says in chapter 2, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So why did Paul write this letter? Well, I think it's obvious from the things we've already said uh, 
that he wrote this letter to warn these Christians against any kind of relapse into paganism and also to warn them against this, quote, solution, this Colossian heresy that was being promoted by some. And then he wrote to them to direct them to Christ, to point them to the beloved Son of God. He says in chapter 1, verse 13 of Jesus, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. He wanted to point the Colossians to Jesus who is the supreme and the sufficient Savior. He says in chapter 1 verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. The, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae tells us so much about Jesus. And we'll be looking at what he says about that in the course of our study together. As is the case with almost every book of the Bible, there's different ways to outline those books. Basically, I think you can divide the letter to the Colossae in two main sections, chapters 1 and chapters 2 emphasize the supremacy of Christ, the preeminence of Christ. And then chapter 3 and chapter 4 talk about our subjection to Christ. But of course that's not the only way to outline this letter. Warren Wiersbe in his little commentary outlines the book in three sections. The first is doctrine, where Christ's preeminence or supremacy is declared. That's chapter one. And then there's danger where Christ's preeminence is defended. That's chapter 2. And then there's a section about duty, where Christ's preeminence is to be demonstrated by Christians. And that's chapter 3 and chapter 4. As I mentioned a moment ago, perhaps the greatest value of this little letter is that it will increase our understanding and hopefully our appreciation of our Savior. In this letter, we will be reminded that Jesus truly is the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father, as he said, but by me, in John 14, verse 6. And once we understand that Jesus is the supreme and the all-sufficient Savior, that'll help us live victorious lives as Christians. And it will assure us that if we do not relapse, if we do not allow ourselves to be carried away by false philosophies, then we can have the life that Jesus promises his people. Well, that's just kind of a bird's eye view of this letter. And we'll be looking at what Paul says in more detail in future lessons. I hope this study will prove to be helpful for all of us. Thank you.